Hello everyone, my name is Dr Chloe Robinson and I'm based out of the Centre for Biodiversity Genomics at the University of Guelph in Canada. I am a white female with black short hair and I'm wearing a purple t-shirt with a B emblem on the chest. Today I'm going to be talking about the application of antifreeze for nationwide community-based DNA metabarcoding of freshwater macroinvertebrates. So Canada currently holds 7% of the world's total renewable fresh water. However, Canadian watersheds are at threat from over-abstraction, pollution, invasive species, habitat loss, and climate change. WWF, which is World Wildlife Fund Canada, releases watershed reports, which are reassessments of watershed health in Canada. And the latest 2020 report showed that 60% of Canada's sub-watersheds are data deficient for health. So here on the left, we have a map of Canada, and a majority of the sub-watersheds in Canada are grey, which correspond to data deficient. In addition, 64% of Canadian sub-watersheds are data deficient for benthic macroinvertebrates. Now, benthic macroinvertebrates are often used as a proxy of health for freshwater systems. So you can see there's still the need for widespread data generation. So we all are aware of citizen science and the benefit it brings to biological monitoring. And similar can be said for the collection of freshwater data. So CABIN, which stands for the Canadian Aquatic Biomonitoring Network, has been established for over 20 years and works with groups all across Canada collecting water samples and uh, river sediment samples, which are then used to assess the health of these different systems. They do this through collecting uh, benthic kick net samples, so three minute standardized kick net, where they then identify the benthic macroinvertebrates using standard morphology and microscopy um, taxonomic analysis. So on the right here, you can see a map that has uh, red, uh, green circles and orange squares. And these correspond to all the projects that have been, uh, all the projects that are ongoing for CABIN across Canada. So as technology improves, more and more citizen science can be used in more sort of technical uh, questions, such as using DNA. So the, one of the best examples of this is the Great Crested Newt study in the UK that used citizen scientists and environmental DNA to look at distribution. Now, CABIN is integrating DNA into their work, and this is being done via the STREAM project. So STREAM stands for Sequencing the Rivers for Environmental Assessment and Monitoring. It is a Canada-wide community-based monitoring project as a collaboration between University of Guelph, World Wildlife Fund, Living Lakes Canada, and Environment and Climate Change Canada. And the aim of this is to collect 1,500 samples across Canada to be put towards assessment of freshwater health. And this is being conducted using DNA metabarcoding. So the kicknet samples that are collected are basically homogenized together into a verticomers DNA soup, which is then used, and then we use that to assess the freshwater health based on the invertebrates that are in the sample. So the DNA metabarcoding procedure looks something like this. So on the left here, we have our environmental sample. So in the case of stream, it's a benthic kicknet. We then extract the DNA from that sample, and then we amplify the DNA to make lots of copies of it. We then sequence it on an Illumina sequencing platform, which is shown here. And then the end result is basically a species and taxa list right down to the species level where we can use to compare against a known reference database of DNA samples. So the overall outcomes of STREAM will be individual community reports. So we have communities sampling all across Canada and they all get a customized report for their area they sampled. This data then feeds into a three year watershed report which will look at the overall health. We also obviously will have the trained water, set, water stewardship group. So in stream, there are training elements. So all the samples are standardized. This is done through Cabin and Living Lakes Canada. And essentially after the end of stream, we still have these people that are trained to continue to collect these samples in the watershed. And all, of course, overall, we have a better understanding of freshwater health. So with a lot of DNA-based studies, often there's a trade-off between the quality of the DNA you collect and the number of DNA samples you can successfully achieve. And obviously using community-based monitoring, this data quality and integrity obviously comes into play. And this is mainly because what we use in stream and most studies use is ethanol, which is 
a regulated chemical, which means you can't often fly with it. And also for accessing remote and uh, indigenous communities, often this is not possible to use ethanol. So you can see from the previous map on the first slide that a lot of the data deficient areas are up in remote areas. And obviously this is further exacerbated by the fact we can't actually sample here due to the issue with ethanol and freezing isn't viable. So we need a widely accessible preservative which preserves DNA effectively so we can apply this project more widespread. So we applied a previously used antifreeze, a propylene glycol based antifreeze, which was previously used for uh, preserving individual arthropods. And we wanted to ask whether we could detect similar alpha and beta diversity in ethanol and antifreeze preserved samples. And to do this, we used two different experiment types, validation sampling and test sampling, which I'll go into on the next slide. And also we wanted to determine whether excess antifreeze inhibits the PCR reaction. So normally with ethanol based samples, we evaporate all the ethanol off prior to DNA extraction, but this is a long procedure and can delay things in the lab. So we wanted to test this using both evaporated and unevaporated samples for both preser preservative types. So for our methods, we use, as I said, the cabin benthic kick net protocol, and we had six sites in total. Three of these were validation sites, three of these were test sites. So in the middle here, you can see the map that has three blue dots and three red dots. The blue dots correspond to validation and the red to test sampling. So validation samples, so one sample was collected, it was then homogenized and then split and preservative was added to this. So this essentially, is a sample that is all universal is then being split so we're not looking so much at the effect of natural variation and the second sampling was test sampling where we homogenized after adding preservatives so you can see on the right here we collected two samples here we added preservative one type to each and then we blended and processed so this way this is more representative of a true environmental sample and then what we also did was we looked at evaporation versus no evaporation so you can see here that we know that ethanol doesn't do very well in terms of DNA extraction if it's not evaporated. We include one of these ethanol samples in the test sampling, but we mainly looked at the effect of antifreeze with and without evaporation. We used a two-step PCR with amplifying three fragments of the cytochrome oxidase one mitochondrial gene, uh, BR5, F230R, and MLGJ. Again, this was sequenced on an aluminum I seq and then we processed the samples using the SCVUC version 4 pipeline. The link to this is available in the paper, which is live on Freshwater Science. Um, and this has various steps to trim the fragments, dereplicate, denoise, and to assign ESVs, which are exact sequence variants, which are essentially like sequences grouped together into ESVs. So we for data analysis, we first verified, so this is normalizing all the samples down to the same read length. We looked at richness at the ESV order and family level. We looked at non-metric multidimensional scaling, which uses a bra binary bray curtis dissimilarities to look at differences. And then we tested these using a permanova on evaporated samples only to keep a balanced design. We then also used heat maps to visualize the different arthropod families in ethanol and antifreeze preserved samples. So for our results, after bioinformatic processing, we retained nearly 20,000 ESVs, of which just over 5,000 of those were assigned to arthropoda. There was actually very little difference between treatment groups in terms of ethanol and antifreeze preserved samples. You can see the figure at the bottom here is a validation sampling, and you can see the sites along the bottom, two panels, left antifreeze, right is ethanol, and then you have arthropod ESV richness up on the y-axis. So you can see here for a lot of the time, the richness was relatively similar. There was no clear trend that ethanol or antifreeze was a great deal better than the other. And the similar can be said, this is a new figure for test sampling, the same layout of the figure. But here you can clearly see that antifreeze had consistently, consistently a higher richness in the test samples. And it also in terms of unevaporated versus evaporated for antifreeze, there was very little difference between the two. And there was 273 ESVs for unevaporated and 271 ESVs for evaporated. So this essentially shows that not evaporating antifreeze doesn't hinder the downstream application of the PCR and sequencing. So results of the NMDS. So you can see a plot here on the left, which has the NMDS dissimilarity matrices. 
And you can see here that the six clusters represent the six sites. So we expect sites to be dissimilar. And also we found that for the different preservative methods, there was a great deal of overlap. Even though there, this was significantly different, it only corresponded to 4% of the variation. And for the experiments, the test versus validation sampling, as you can see, these cluster very distinctly on the left and the right. This was also significantly different, uh, but does explain nearly 20% of the variation. So most of the variation we see in this dissimilarity matrix comes from the experiment. And here we have our heat map. So this first plot shows validation. Along the top, you have your different sites and the technical replicates A to C. And the bottom, you have ethanol and antifreeze repeated to basically compare side by side an ethanol and antifreeze sample. And on the y-axis, we have our EPT, which are the bioindicator orders of mayflies, caddis flies, and stoneflies along the y-axis. And really, you can see here that between ethanol and antifreeze samples within each technical replica, it was relatively similar. Some cases, ethanol detected something antifreeze didn't, and vice versa. And again, similar layout for the test sample figure on the screen. Actually, surprisingly, this was more representative. So the samples, antifreeze and ethanol, were closer together in terms of similarity for the test, which is surprising because obviously we have a degree of natural variation between samples for this. But it's great news to show that antifreeze isn't significantly worse than ethanol. And you find a similar composition of arthropods in both. So overall, we found that ESV richness, especially arthropods, because that's where our focus was, was comparable between preservative types. The main source of variation was between the sites and the experiments, so the validation versus test sampling, which again we expect. Antifreeze does perform very well with or without evaporation, which actually cuts down three hours of lab processing time, which is great news for the stream project, where we try and get these reports out within a two month cycle from them being submitted. And we've actually used this to see the validation and test sampling actually is a very good study design for testing new preservatives. This way you can test a preservative without the effect of natural variation of two separate samples and then use the test design to actually test it on real exact samples to see how well the preservative performs. So this was great news for the stream project and overall community-based biomonitoring because it means that we can actually sample in locations where antifreeze can be used and that we couldn't previously access. So we can sample up in remote northern regions and we can access indigenous communities for collecting data. Obviously, the in speed up of the lab time is great news. We can get the sample reports out quicker and we can increase the spatial coverage. So we can begin to target some of these data deficient watersheds, which is really important for understanding the overall health of Canadian freshwater systems. We are moving on to looking at this long term capacity of antifreeze. So we're looking at about three months for antifreeze compared with ethanol. So we're looking to see how well antifreeze is for longer term than just the, the essential three days that we used in this study. I'd like to thank a few people. Um, obviously, the Hajipa Biolab, where this work is conducted, um, our stream partners and our community groups wouldn't be possible to do this without the contributions of community groups. And we are funded by Genome Canada, Ontario Genomics, and co-funding from Environment and Climate Change Canada and WWF Canada. To find out more about Stream, here are our social media tags for Twitter, Instagram, our website, and our email. Thank you very much for listening.